I got to go to an exhibition of Jean-Michel Basquiat, an artist who lived in the 1980s and died at the age of 27, leaving behind a wide body of works, a lot of different interpretations of what he was going for, and most importantly, a family that wanted his legacy to live on. I wanted to focus on how this exhibition was put together, what it was trying to do, and how it occurred to me how many different issues are brought up when you want to capture a human life in museum form. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Jean-Michel Basquiat was a world-renowned artist by the time he was 20 and before his death had played a part in all sorts of groundbreaking exhibitions, accolades, and awards. He was crushed by celebrity, and it's considered to be one of the reasons for his early death. And his family took over his legacy, with his father specifically running the estate for the rest of his life, until the next generation of the family took over the torch, leading to this exhibition. It was in the first floor of an office building, where all of the different rooms had been arranged and put together as a almost maze of exhibits, examples, and pieces of Basquiat's life so that we could walk through and in some way try to understand his life and his story. Fundamentally, this interests me because I'm in the process of acquiring all sorts of people's lives, digital, analog, digitized, remixed, collated, turned into archive files or presented as PDFs or slides in such a way that I don't know what sort of end destination they are going to consist of. Going to this exhibition gave me some insight in one possible way this could all come together. Once you walk in past the admission booth, you go down a hallway with a number of decontextualized drawings of notepads and scratches of ideas from Basquiat, combinations of phrases and words and doodles, without any indication of what they're for or what they represent. After you go down this hallway, you're informed that it is a one-way trip. You are, you are going through a set of rooms and locations, and you can't go back. The ceiling is open. This is, after all, the kind of space that would have some sort of Nike store or clothing emporium that you would go through. Instead, you focus on the 15-foot walls in all the different directions, covered in wood with words carved into them to indicate different phases of what you're seeing. The first phase is Basquiat's early life, pictures and home movies of him as a child, and a map of Manhattan and Brooklyn showing where he lived, where he worked, where he hung out, events that happened in his life, laid out to a level of complication that even I found pretty overwhelming. There are remnants of small drawings he did as a youth, along with a number of statements from his family about different parts of how the family grew up around him. Turning a corner, you start to see early art that he did things for his school newspaper, drawings he did at his kitchen table, the kind of things you would expect to come out of a precocious 11 or 12-year-old. Following that to the next phase, there are two rooms on either side of where you're walking. One is a recreation of the family living room, and the other a recreation of their kitchen. This was odd. It wasn't a demonstration of his art or his early influences. It was just meant to make you soak in some sort of vignette of what was, where a person lived and what they were doing, and where they might have derived some part of their life from that they drew on in later years. I'm not sure how well that came across, although it was very enjoyable to see a recreated living room from any era, 40 or 50 years ago. After that, we begin to walk through rooms of art, art he made that entered into competitions or created working with Andy Warhol, bright, 
primary colored paints with words carved into them, abstract figures representing different aspects of life and influence and forces, headed up in one side of an extraordinarily large painting, which turns out, as you read about it, to be the last piece of art he was known to have done and which he gave to his father and which his father had kept all of his life. And along one side of this room, a bicycle that he rode around the city when taxi drivers wouldn't pick him up, with all of the markings and scratches of being chained to a whole variety of things in New York City. Walking from that phase to the next one, we go down the middle of a completely recreated art studio, the art studio where his majority of output had come from, with different pieces of inspiration and equipment and artworks he had created on the walls and leaning up against different corners. I think the idea here would be for somebody to soak into what the arrangement of these works might be, what an artist's studio might look like at the time. After that phase, we see more paintings, this time separated into small side rooms that we walk into and then dip out. After passing through these additional rooms, you then go down another hallway. Along this hallway are three or four screens, each of them running in synchronicity, a documentary, with the members of the family, sisters and cousins, talking about the legacy of the family and what the art meant and what it meant to them to be able to share it with us. This documentary, more a statement, runs for about four or five minutes. Then we go around the corner to what would normally be the exit, but instead there's a variety of photos of Basquiat with Andy Warhol and other people at New York City nightclubs and talking about how important the nightlife was to his work and his life, where he found energy and inspiration. And behind those pictures is a recreated nightclub, a VIP room from the Palladium, where two extraordinarily large paintings by Basquiat had hung on the walls, one of them easily 20 or 30 feet and the other one just as imposing, while in the center of this room a number of couches are arranged, allowing people to sit inside, look at these enormous paintings, and hear blasting dance music of the era coming out from a bunch of speakers. Ostensibly, people hang around, discuss what they've seen, and then make their way out to the inevitable gift shop, full of Funko Pop figurines, keychains, t-shirts, books, and everything else that takes an image and can be sold. Walking out on the street, you join the city again, having lived for a very short time in the world of Basquiat. Now that's a very basic description of what was there. And what I'm doing in the modern era is starting to understand exactly how commodified these sort of displays are. That there's firms, consultants you hire, you present them with what you want to portray, they source the images, they source the transport, the costs, the underlying logistics of assembling so much art in one place, and then presenting it all in a way that can sustain thousands or tens of thousands of crowds over a given time, with, I suspect, the added spin that they're designed to be photographed to be made into a moment on a cell phone that you share with this artist and, and share your moment with anybody who wants to see. With very few exceptions, most displays are designed in this way, with centralized or specific consultants creating an experience based on what's wanted by the producer. The producers don't have to figure out where you're going to get this sort of wood, have it carved this way, how to move these paintings that may be worth millions of dollars safely into being seen, along with verifying the security, the conservancy aspect, the temperature and humidity, and then ensuring that it is staffed properly with people trained in what they need to do to move the crowds through. This is all a business now. But pulling it back, it's clear that a group sat around a table and advised logistics people and contractors over what they wanted. And it appears that what they wanted was to turn a life 
into some sort of demonstrative show. That the best way to show you how his life was lived was to assemble the sounds, the sights, the objects that represented what this artist came into contact with. There's a room where you can see all of the different figurines that he would buy on various tourist trips. There's a room with a refrigerator door, maybe taken from an apartment or from a studio, that has all sorts of stickers and drawings on it, without, in that case, much context as to where it came from. The artist's studio is also interesting. It's a fiction created inside of a location as a stage, as a display a variance of a space, of a living life, shifted around based on availability and design decisions to look like where somebody had lived. When I had visited the Mundanium in Belgium, a similar setup was on the second floor. You could walk into a room and sitting in front of you was a recreation of what the office of the founder of the Mundanium had used for a period of time. I had no idea when this office existed, where these items had come from, how authentic they were, whether I was looking at some simulacrum of some sort of reality or the reality itself shifted into a room and then forgotten for some period of time. We run into this when we see these items. This tension exists in all historical work trying to bring to the eyes of a contemporary audience meaning and context of something there once was and where they themselves have changed. After all, we live in a world where GPS and smartphones have removed a lot of the cloud of not knowing and speculating as to how things are before being absolutely told by simply asking Google nearby, what's the answer? To have GPS that tells us exactly how to get home, with no chance of wandering into a place we didn't expect and coming out again, learning about a new world we'll want to explore again and again. Turning a living room and a kitchen into an exhibit as if it was some sort of ice cream machine that could create a world-famous artist, an incredible, unique spirit, and demonstrate where that spirit came from, to me, is a bit of a fool's errand. I honestly don't know how much of that represents an actual teaching moment or simply making a mourning family realize that there was a time when things were happy, when everything was complete, when potential hung in the air at every moment. We, as an audience, walking through a darkened set of rooms nearly 40 years after an artist's death, trying to understand what made that artist who they were, is to me a little bit less of a teaching moment and more of a reliquary, more of a demonstration of what was lost, what is gone, a memorial more than a lesson. So I walk out past Funko Pops and keychains, asking myself, was justice done here? Were things done right? And the answer is, I'll never know. I'll never know if a young artist walks through this museum of somebody else's life and is inspired to know that they have the freedom to make their own visions known and that maybe, just maybe, the world will sit up and notice. I don't know in that ersatz cosplay of the VIP lounge of the Palladium at the end of the tour whether somebody sits there for way too long with the staff never checking on them, swirling in thoughts and potential, setting their journey in a new direction and inspiring them to go to places they never otherwise would have dreamed of going. I don't know what those effects are, but I do know this. As I move agnostically through collecting all of the ephemera and the items that I do in my daily work, these digital footprints and artifacts of lives long ago and lives gone, perhaps I should focus even less than I do as to where they potentially may end up and what effect they'll have. Because it's clear to me, as we struggle between the different forces of family and commerce and logistics and memories. Nobody, and I really do mean nobody, can truly predict what's going to happen next. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Josiah Lucher, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, 
Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Perhaps it says something that instead of focusing on one piece of art or one particular work that brought me memories or inspiration, my personal information was the arrangement. Putting together this space was itself the real work of art, done by people who finished and then turned to the next project immediately, to be sure. But in its own way, out of this neutral office space, a little world came into being, will live for a while, and then itself disappear into our memories. I hope somebody took some pictures. <laughs>